Well, we're finishing up Ephesians, um, looking at Paul's last words to the to the church, and this is this is the roadmap. This is where we're going to go. Um, we're going to finish Ephesians today. Then we do a two week uh, Palm Sunday and then Easter Sunday. Um, after Easter, we're going to go through Malachi. We're going back to the Old Testament. We're going to try to go Old Testament, New Testament um, through the year. And we're going to spend several weeks in Malachi. So if you want to know where we're headed, um, April 28th, we'll start several weeks going through the book of Malachi. So if you want to read ahead, you can. But as we wrap this one up, um, my biggest takeaway that I want us to take from the book of Ephesians is that gospel transformation impacts, changes, and affects every aspect of our lives, not just how, not just what we do on Sundays. And as it ends, we're pulled back. So we've had all of this from Paul um, pouring out to the church at Ephesus, and now we pull back and we see where he is, which is prison. We see where he's headed, Rome, ultimately for his death. And the nature of the gospel, which is that it's for us in hostility, and that's how we're going to end this, is we're going to see how we live in hostility. So gospel transformation calls us to prayer and boldness in that hostility. We're going to read um, verse 18, the second part, all the way through verse 20 in Ephesians 6. So if you've got a, uh, a Bible, you can, you can turn there. If you don't, we have it on the screen behind me. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Verse 19, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Father, we're reminded that our situation as believers is that we are strangers and aliens in a foreign land, that we are living in the land of death and all around us is a reminder that this world is not our home but you've called us to be here you've called us to live here and you've called us to persevere through the hostility and so i pray that we would do that knowing that one day you're going to make all things right and good and that our home is with you. So until that day comes, and as we observe that later with the supper, I pray that we would be reminded that there's still work to do, and you're not finished yet. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want to pull three things out of this that, that hostility does for us. Um, the first is that hostility requires prayer. Um, Got to keep in mind, this is, so this is the part two to last week. Last week with the armor of God was part one. Part two is today. Uh, and there's a bridge between the two, which is prayer. Um, verse 18 is all about prayer. It talks about that, to pray with, at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplications. Kind of how we ended last week talking about that prayer becomes the fuel for spiritual warfare. Well, now we're going to see that, that the hostility that we're a part of demands prayer, and that's the bridge that we make. And this is prayer that's both dialogical, it means that it involves us speaking to God, and then God through his word, through his spirit, through other people, speaking to us, it's dialogue. We don't just tell God things like a monologue, which is what often happens where we just kind of do, unload on God and then hang up the phone. Um, God, prayer, dialogical prayer is where we talk and we listen. It's responsive, it's focused, and it's ongoing. This is something that's not just perfunctory that we do before we eat, before church. This is something that's, that's a conversation throughout the day, um, just like Kim said with the kids from, from Thessalonians. We pray without ceasing. So that's where we need to live, wear the armor of God. Um, it's, it, we live in host hostility. And I don't want to be tinfoil hat guy. Um, far from that. I, don't, I, I think Christians who, who dabble in conspiracy theories or bogus internet rumors, which are a bunch, uh, Pepsi, you know, all, all these other silly things. I think Christians who engage in those things, conspiracy theories or bogus internet rumors, um, are basically jumping up and down on the Ninth Commandment. And so I want to encourage us not to be a part of that. Um, 
it, part of, I don't know, if, maybe this is like part of my sanctification, um, but I, I have to bite and ah! whenever I see the silly, the bogus internet rumors about whatever, and, and usually they're, they're all, all, all you have to do is just do a Google search and you can prove them wrong. We live in hostile times. I don't want to be tinfoil hat guy when I say that because I don't want it to come off like we're, we're being like um, exterminated or, or something silly like that. Um, but we do have a hostility that's around us. And it's not just an overt hostility, um, which is where we see that the, that the church now is more persecuted than it has ever been. Um, it's persecuted in um, the, the East. It's persecuted in the Global South. And you know, depending on, on where you what what you find, you'll see um, varying numbers. But one of the things that, that's pretty consistent is that more Christians have been martyred in the last hundred years than in the 1900 before that. Um, we're seeing more martyrdom. We're seeing more people dying for their faith over persecution. Whether it comes through regimes, socialist regimes, whether it comes through um, dictatorial regimes, so you have national persecution in places like um, China, North Korea, or you have overt um, kind of grassroots persecution from like Hindu nationalists in India, um, or kind of um, state, you know, states, not state sponsored, but state ignored, um, which you typically find in a lot of Muslim countries where, um, you know, Islamic uh, bands form together and they persecute Christians and they kill Christians and they assault them and they, they um, you know, persecute them. So we have that. So there's an overt, but then more so, there's kind of a growing antagonism or antipathy to um, believers, and that's that's what we find ourselves in. And so the latest thing that kind of got the got the attention was was about the movie Unplanned, where um, their their Twitter feed was basically shut down, where people tried to follow, engage, share, and the algorithm um, reset itself. And so there was kind of a pushback that said. Time out, you know, hang on. Um, we're, this is being labeled, um, but nothing's ever done about NARL or Planned Parenthood or any of these other barbaric groups that endorse the slaughter of children. Um, why is this being singled out? Um, there's a professor at the University of Louisville who was just recently fired for um, speaking out against um, the kind of the transgender movement. He said parents should be empathetic, but they should encourage children to live within their biological sex. He got whacked for it. Um, there's been a, a professor at University of Texas that got fired for public a peer-reviewed study talking about the effects of homosexuality and homosexual marriage on kids. Okay. This kind of growing antipathy to the things of faith, to Christians. Um, this isn't, what was it, God's Not Dead 3 that kind of made it, made it out to be like, you know, there's like a, an Illuminati against Christians. Not that at all. Um, but there is a growing hostility. And so we respond to that in perseverance, making supplication for the saints. So we pray for each other. Here's the thing. Not everyone is going through necessarily overt or, host or antagonistic hostility. Sometimes they're just going through the dullness of life. And so we carry each other through in prayer. Because it is increasingly difficult to become a, to be a Christian. It's not, you know, there, there used to be a time where it was socially acceptable. <coughs> Excuse me. And I will be among the first to say that the death of Christendom is actually the greatest thing that could happen to the church because now we're actually seeing that it matters to become a Christian, that you don't just self-identify as one, and that's enough. But what we're saying here is that this, this passage calls us to pray for the saints. So if you're wondering how it is that we can pray for each other, how you can pray for those in hostility, here's a couple of suggestions that you can take for, for that. You can, you can be a part of, you can subscribe to things like Voice of the Martyrs, which is the worldwide publication supporting the persecuted or underground church. You can subscribe to a daily email service called Unreached People of the Day. And every day you will learn about a people group, a group, a tribe, a, a nationality, a, a racial group that has not been touched with the gospel. There's less than 2% evangelical witness. They are lost. 
And they're not just lost, they're unengaged, they're unreached. And you can daily learn about them and pray for them that the gospel might go to them. We know who these people are. We know where they live. We know a lot about them, but we haven't gotten to them yet. You can pray for those groups. You can plug into a group. And one of the greatest ways that we can pray for each other is to actually be around each other. And so if you're not plugged into a Sunday school class, if you're not connected to some group of believers, you're not doing it right. I'm trying to say how to think about how to phrase it. You're not doing it right. You're doing it on your own. You can't do it on your own. You need each other. And so if you're plugged into a group, if you're part of a Sunday school class, then you can share what you're going through and have other believers rally around you in prayer to help you persevere. Another way that we, we persevere is that we, we recognize what's going on and we endure. Look, here's the thing. As if we're going through a neighborhood we don't recognize, or if we're um, going through, a, let's say, a dark alley in downtown, are we going to go through that alley like this? No. You're going to be paying attention. You're going to be looking around. You're going to look for visual cues and have, in case you have to describe where you are. <laughs> To, to the 911 operator. Or you're going to be looking for ways that if you have to, to, to make an escape, you got, you got to do this. No, I'll never forget taking a group on a mission trip to Memphis, and one of them, one of the kids, we're in one of those, we're one of those intersections where I, I, I had told the other driver, hey, if you see me go through the red light, just follow. Okay? <laughs> we're just going to go. Red lights are suggestions in some parts of town. And, and so this kid, no, really, it's true. Carrie's up here nodding. She's like, no, we, we, these are true. Cheryl agrees. Um, and one of our kids was like, hey, can I go get that hubcap off the sidewalk? No. No, you're not going to go wander in a neighborhood that's not safe and go get a hubcap. We wouldn't do that. So as believers, why do we just simply idly strut through life and not acknowledge that where we live is, is hostile? Why aren't we praying? Why aren't we persevering in prayer? In your bulletin, write down the names of two or three people that you know who are going through this hostility. It might be overt. You might have a friend who is facing losing their job because of their, their faith. You might have a friend from overseas, a college classmate who's an international student who's now back at home and they know that because of their faith, they're either going to be disowned or killed. Or you might just know someone who's just going through some hard times right now. Write those names down and commit to pray for them for the next few days. Second thing is that hostility requires boldness. Paul many times will ask for prayer for himself. And what's interesting is that most of the time when he asks for prayer, he... He doesn't ask for comfort. In fact, when he wants comfort, he tells him to bring books, which all of us bibliophiles are like, oh, yes, I understand. Um, comfort, bring books, yes, more books. Um, but mostly what he prays for is he prays for faithfulness. And Paul was in a unique spot where he was able to have access. The, men's, the Tuesday morning men's group has, for the last few months, walked through the book of Acts. And one of the striking things that Acts does is it not only tells us about the, the early church and what they did and where they grew and the progression of, of the church from Jerusalem to, to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, but it also gives us a unique glimpse at the Apostle Paul and how God had uniquely called him and equipped him and prepared him through the providence before Paul ever became a Christian, while he was living as a Pharisee, while he was living as a persecutor of the church, from his upbringing, from his Roman citizenship, from the comfort and the, and the, the seamless ability to navigate the Hebraic world and the Greek world without ever missing a beat. How God was able to use him to not only have access to kings and princes, but also how he was able through his tent making to have access to everybody else. This is where I think we, we need to recognize that God has, has called us as believers to be bold in our faith. Another word for bold is clear, clear or understanding or um, plain. That God has called us to, to be bold in the face of hostility. Boldness is not brashness. And this is where I think a lot of Christians sometimes fall, fall into kind of a trap of, of being brash 
without being bold. Bold is proclaiming needed truth in urgency. So there's a, there is a, a, an urgent need for truth to be told for the sake of transformation. Repent. Trust Christ. Eternity awaits. That's bold. Because you're telling the world that says, we're fine, we're good, we're, we're all right. And telling them, you're not all right. In fact, you're so not all right that if you were to die without Christ, you'd go to hell. But there is a remedy. There is an answer which has been provided on the cross whereby when we put our faith in Jesus and receive the gift of forgiveness that comes from his substitutionary death in our place, we not only are free, we have access to God. And one day when all this is gone, we're going to go to heaven. That's a pretty bold message. Brash just likes to be loud and pundity and want to scream. There's a huge difference. So some Christians want to be bold, but what they really mean is they want to be brash, and they just want to yell and get into online fights or try to do all these silly things that have no redemptive value at all. That's why one of the greatest things that you can do whenever, you, whenever someone wants to pick a fight online is just not to feed the troll. Or do what I do. I send Disney pictures. So whenever someone gets, you know, whenever I've had it happen a few times where I'm like, oh, great, here we go again. So I'm like, I'm sending them pictures of Elsa singing Let It Go. I'm sending all these, all these Disney things. And that's just my way of dealing with the trolls, um, is, is I like to have a little bit of fun with them. Boldness is compelled by love. Brashness just wants to prove a point. See, whenever Paul would go into a city and he'd get beat up, or he'd get flogged, or he'd get kicked out, it was never because he was a jerk. It was because of his message. And one of the things that I think we really struggle with as believers is that it's not our message that's offensive, it's us. So that's because we're, we're brash. We just want to prove a point. We want to get the zinger in. Do you know why we want to get the zinger in? Because that's what happens all around us. That's why you can't watch TV anymore when they have, an, when they have a debate. Because it's not a debate over issues. It's just yelling over each other. Which, that's what works for the WWF, but it doesn't work for anywhere else. Boldness seeks the loss to be found. Boldness is where we plainly and we clearly tell the lost how they can be found. I'll never forget one of our doctoral professors talking about this when he was, when he was being interviewed on some TV show. Because he said the worst news of all is that someone could be lost and not even know they're lost and no one's looking for them. That's a scary, scary place to be. But as believers, we have an urgency, we have a boldness to tell a clarity, a plainness to tell the lost how they can be found. Brash just wants the bad to know that they're bad. Boldness speaks through tears, which is what we see so often in the New Testament. Whenever there's a pleading, it's, it, Paul, Paul talks about pleading, which is begging, which is, is giving all this through tears. Brash really doesn't care who gets hurt by what they say. For our message to be bold, to be confident, to be plain, it has to be clear. And I think that's why we get scared to share sometimes. So I've got a little clip, it's, it's a couple minutes long, that, can, that you can use when you're sharing this message. It's three circles on a napkin. If you haven't seen this yet, I think this is one of the best ways to share your faith because it's, it's, it's succinct, it's plain, it's clear. Um, Jimmy Scroggins and Steve Wright, one of my good friends, helped put this together. And it's being used by churches all across the country. So let's, let's see this real quick. So we live in this world and it's characterized by brokenness. We don't have to look very hard to see. There are things like disease, disasters, wars. There's a lot of pain in this world, but this is not God's original design. God has a perfect design. And the way that we have gotten ourselves into brokenness is through something that the Bible calls sin. Sin is turning away from God's design and pursuing our own way. And that leads us to brokenness. Brokenness eventually leads us to death, and this death will separate us from God forever. But God doesn't want us to stay in brokenness, so he's made a way out, and that way is Jesus. Jesus comes and he enters into our brokenness, and the death that we deserve for pursuing brokenness, Jesus takes our place and dies on a cross, and his body is broken for us. 
And three days after he dies, he rose from the dead, and he made a way out of brokenness. And people try many things to get out of brokenness, things like religion, things like success or relationships, education or drugs and alcohol, but none of these things can get us out of brokenness. The only way out is Jesus. And if we turn from our sin and believe that Jesus died for us and rose from the dead, we can leave brokenness and grow in a relationship with God and pursue his design. And more than that, we can go. We can be sent, just like Jesus, back into brokenness to help others come through him to pursue God's design. Now, there's two types of people in the world. There are people that are pursuing God's design, and there's people that are still in brokenness. We have to ask ourselves, where are we? So, where do you think you are? Where do you think you are? And if you present it and you say, look, it doesn't take much... And that's the clarity of the gospel message. The gospel message doesn't have to convince people that there's bad in the world. Just watch the 6 o'clock news. If it bleeds, it leads. Everything's out there. And so we can't, we can't ever lose sight of that. Remember, if there's anyone in the New Testament who, who could say, you know what, I don't care. Let them rot. It's Paul. Every time he turns around, he's being mistreated. He's being arrested, he's being beaten, he's being imprisoned for doing nothing except sharing Jesus. He's not stealing, he's not killing anyone, he's kept the commandments, he hasn't done anything, he's not born false witness, he's not lying, he's not, he's not coveting, he's just telling people about Jesus. And if anyone has any right in the New Testament to go, you know what, all of y'all can rot. It's Paul. He's like, look what you did to me. But instead, what does he say? He wants to share the gospel. That he might declare it boldly. He's an ambassador in his chains. He doesn't look at himself as a prisoner. He goes, actually, this is great because now I've got access. Because now I'm, I'm you know, and there's always the, the image of Paul being chained to a Roman soldier. Guess what? That soldier doesn't have anywhere to go. So Paul can either go, well, I can either sit here and stew, or I can tell this poor guy who's stuck to me about Jesus. Captive audience. Just taking advantage of a situation. But if we've been transformed by the gospel, and we've been set free from sin, and given a new life by King Jesus, why wouldn't we want to share that one? Why wouldn't we want to plainly tell other people how they can have that as well? The last thing is that hostility leads to mission. We're living on hostile territory. We're not on friendly soil. Our hostility leads to mission. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. Enemy-occupied territory. That's what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. You might even say landed in disguise. And is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. I love this country. I love this state. I love my neighborhood. I love this community. I love the, the, the perks that come along with it. But you know what? I want to see everything thrown upside down. I want to see everything sabotaged. I want to see everything that is about where we live thrown upside down and thrown into worldly chaos for the sake of Jesus. I want us as Christians to look and say, look, listen all of y'all, it's sabotage. Let's do it. Let's look at our mission. See, when, we, when, we're, when we're living on mission, when we're telling people about Jesus, when we're taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, we're sabotaging the world system. And what I'm not talking about is some kind of idea of a hostile takeover or some kind of coerced, um, kind of transformation because that's the that's the that's I think the the legacy of of cultural Christianity is forced transformation and it really doesn't do anything it just kind of inoculates people to the gospel because they think that be, they're they're good and they're not bad that means they're okay but that's not the believer's responsibility that's not the believer's role in this world we are put behind enemy lines and it's not safe. Let's be honest. The world is hostile to the things of God. It has been from the very beginning. To paraphrase how Leonard Ravenhill said it, if the world couldn't get along with the holiest man who's ever lived, how in the world do you think it can get along with us? 
If the world crucified Christ, what do you think they're going to do to us? Jesus even said, look, the world is not going to like you, but press on. And as Lewis said, sabotage everything. Sabotage it. What I am saying, God has placed us in places of difficulty, in cultures that are apathetic or antagonistic to us, for the sake of us calling out for repentance. Let's read John 10. John 10, verses 14 through 16. Just keep this in mind. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 16 should flatten you. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. All around us are people that God has set his love on, that God has purposed to save, and that he's put us in the position to share with them. God has called out people from around the world to follow him. And it's like a great game of hide and seek where God's called believers to cry out, to plead, to share, to evangelize, to witness, and let the fruit come. There's people all around us, and God's not finished working on them yet. They might be in a gutter, stoned out of their mind right now. They might have come out of a line from a Planned Parenthood yesterday. They might be living with their boyfriend or girlfriend. They might be even married to their same-sex partner. They might be, in whatever way, in, in the throes of the trappings of a fallen and dysfunctional world, which includes people who have sat in church for 30, 40, 50 years And instead of responding to the gospel, have inoculated themselves, have vaccinated themselves to the gospel. That they've heard just enough that their heart isn't pricked by their conscience anymore. Just like how a flu virus or a flu vaccine gives you just enough of the flu so that you can fight it. There are tons of lowercase c Christians, people who call themselves believers, people who have attended church for 30, 40, 50 years, who have no relationship with Jesus Christ through faith and salvation because they've inoculated themselves. And let me tell you, God is not finished with them yet. God has called us as believers on mission to take the gospel to them. The answer to the hostility around us isn't fear. What do we have to fear? What's the worst thing that can happen to a believer? Death? Paul says that's gain. You mean I could be out of this body with its bad knees and bad eyesight and frailness that gets colds too easy? And I can be free from that? Yeah, that sounds nice. Retreat? The answer to hostility is not retreat. No, we, we, we stand firm, just like Paul told us in the preceding passage about the armor of God. We stand firm because who's fighting for us? Us? No way. It's, it's up to us. We lose every time. But God fights. God fights our battles for us. And we certainly don't go nuclear. There's a reason why Movies like Crimson Tide and some of these others about kind of the nuclear, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, all of those are so fascinating for us is because we know if they actually push the button, everything's over. Everything we know is done. And as believers, this is not the answer to our hostility that we live around. This is not to blow it up and become Amish or separate completely or kind of create a a Christian subculture bubble that we never leave from. It's that we seek out the same gospel transformation in others that changed our lives. That changed our lives. That's the message of Ephesians. Gospel transformation changes everything about us. In a moment, we're going to sing, and we're going to flip the order from how we typically do it when we observe the Lord's Supper. But we're going to sing, only trust Him. And we're going to sing this, and this is, this is going to be something that we sing as a prayer. If, if God has worked on you in some way this morning and you need to, to talk about it, we'll be available after the service. Please do not leave without 
speaking to one of us with one of the name tags on. That's one of our members, it's one of our attenders. If you want to find me or Nathaniel or Kim or Angela, come and talk to us. We'd be happy to sit down with you and to talk to you about how God's worked on you this morning. But we're going to sing, and we're going to sing only trust him as a prayer, as a commitment. Not just something that we're going to sing perfunctory, but we're going to sing this as a commitment. And then to solidify our commitment, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper together as a visible, tangible reminder that we are on mission for God together as a church. Commission as disciples given a covert mission of sabotage to love where we are, but to see everything undone for the glory of King Jesus. Let's pray and then we'll sing. Father, we thank you for your word that shows us how we live in hostility. That it's something where we pray, where we're bold, but you've also given us a mission. So as we sing, only trust you. We only trust you. We give you our lives, give you our hearts, we give you our everything, and we trust you because you are worthy. In King Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.